Good evening, everyone. So glad to see you all. My name is Ilana Silber, and I am the CEO at Char Sharet. I am so thrilled that tonight's program will feature the most inspiring Hadassah Lieberman, also a good friend of mine, and the author of Hadassah, An American Story, in conversation with the award-winning journalist, editor, and author, Sandy Bowarski. Uh, before we begin, I just wanted to thank our sponsors for tonight's program, Merck and CGen. Uh, their generosity really enables us to continue to bring um, education and support programs to you and your family all across the country. And I'm also really pleased and grateful that we have several community partners here with us tonight who help share this event with their communities and bring us all together. Thank you to the Beaker Cholim of Farakaway and the Five Towns, Hewlett House, Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center of Nassau County, the Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center, the JCC of Chicago, Mid Island YJCC, and the Suffolk YJCC. Please note that the webinar will be recorded and it will be posted on Sharsharet's website along with a transcript your faces, the participants' faces, will not show up in the recording. So you can keep your screens on and don't worry, we won't be seen afterwards. Mm -hmm. Also, when we let you in tonight into the Zoom, you were entered on mute. We really ask that you keep yourself muted. We have lots of people on the call and we really wanna hear the presentation. Um, and to really enjoy the presentation to the best extent, put your screen on speaker view. Um, you can find this option in the upper right hand corner of your screen and you will have an opportunity to ask your questions uh, to Hadassah and to Sandy um, through the chat. So you can write anything you want in the chat button is at the bottom of your screen. So for those of you who are new to Shar Sharet, uh, we are the National Jewish Breast and Ovarian Cancer Organization and for the past 20 years we have been providing support and education programs and much to our good fortune, in some ways, we have always provided services remotely. They've been easily accessible by phone and email um, and through the internet. So um, over the past year and a half, we were able to continue providing programs and services um, throughout the pandemic and as we continue and we continue to do so as it um, as things start to ease up a little bit. Um, and so again, so, we want you to keep us in mind, should you or anyone you know be affected by breast cancer or ovarian cancer, to please um, feel free to send them our way. Um, I also wanted to do a little bit of an introduction to the remarkable women who we have on, to, on our call tonight. Um, I'll start with Hadassah Lieberman. Hadassah Lieberman has dedicated much of her life's work to healthcare issues. Um, assisting nonprofit organizations, improving educational standards, and promoting international understanding with a particular focus on global women's health. Um, Hadassah was the global ambassador with Komen for the Cures, Global Initiative for Breast Cancer, and worked to create sustainable breast cancer outreach and education programs all across the world. And many of you may remember that the very first Race for the Cure hosted by Komen um, years ago uh, was one of Hadassah's projects. And we were so fortunate to be a part of that experience in Jerusalem, bringing together all different members of the community for a common cause. It was truly inspirational. Um, and Hadassah was, uh, was the brains and the beauty behind all that. Um, Hadassah was born in Prague in the Czech Republic in 1949. She left Eastern Europe with her family and moved to Gardner, Massachusetts, where she grew up. She went on to earn a BA from Boston University in government and dramatics and an MA in international relations and American government from Northeastern University. She built a career devoted largely to public health that has included positions at Lehman Brothers, Pfizer, and the National Research Council. After her first marriage ended in divorce, she married Senator Joe Lieberman, the U.S. Senator from Connecticut, who was the Democratic nominee for Vice President with Al Gore and would go on to run for president. So welcome Hadassah. For Sandy's bio, Sandy 
um, is an award-winning journalist, editor, and author. Uh, she recently received her fourth Simon Rockauer Award for Excellence in Jewish Journalism. Her essays and articles have appeared in many publications, including the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the Lancet, Hadassah, and the Jerusalem Post. And for many years, Sandy served as culture editor of the Jewish Week. Um, so I, uh, Sandy lives in Teaneck, uh, New Jersey, with her husband, Barry Lichtenberg, and family. And I just want to mention, she's the author of several books, most recently, 212 Views of Central Park, Experiencing New York's Jewel from Every Angle, with photographer Mick Hales. So with that, I turn the floor over to Hadassah and to Sandy, and take it away. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you so much, Ilana, and good evening, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here with Hadassah Lieberman and to speak with our friends at Sharsheret. Hadassah has written a really terrific book. It's beautifully written, so thoughtful, generous, proudly Jewish, deeply personal and also universal, with so much that's resonant for so many of us. And it's a great American story told with gratitude. I was an admirer of Hadassah even before I read this memoir, and now I'm an even bigger fan, and I'm so impressed by her abilities to draw people together. I remember hearing her powerful speech at the Democratic Convention with thousands of people holding up placards that said Hadassah. So the format is that we're going to have a wide ranging conversation and then we'll leave time for your questions. Some of you have already sent in questions and you can continue to send them to us um, through the chat function. So Hadassah, I thought um, we'd start um, with the inspiration for writing your book, Hadassah, an American Story. Um, maybe you can tell us about that and also why now? Well, first of all, I wanna say hello to everyone who's joined us and I, want to begin with a statement of applause, deeply meant applauding Sharsheret, the wonderful works that you do for so many people around the globe, really in your unique position. So thank you. So here I am. I, you know, you, you don't know, you don't think in advance, oh, I'm gonna write a book. Maybe some people do, but that wasn't my thing. I wasn't sitting there authoring books as my husband's done. And all of a sudden, I, my mother had died. I was sorting through her library, things she had around her apartment, as so many of us do at certain times in our lives. And then I came across a book that ended up being a diary written in the Czech language, which I didn't know. I knew Yiddish, I didn't know Czech. And I took it to the Holocaust Museum when we were in Washington, and I had them translate this record of my mother starting with a short message that said, I cannot write anymore. I depend on my children, my daughter and my son to build on this story, to say what needs to be said. Well, when I read that, I was shocked. I started shaking because I said, oh God, I have to write. I have to do research. I have to see what's going on. So I began to write and I look through all these little pictures and all kinds of things that told me what I had to do. And I did it at that point when she had died and all I had was this diary and other things, her paintings, her words. And I knew that here I had come to this point in my life married to Joe, so I was a senator's wife, a senator who had run a national campaign that I was part of as vice president 
and then later as president. And I knew that I'd come out of this dark milieu and I had been born out of my mother coming out of Auschwitz, liberated from Dachau, my father from slave labor camp. And I being the baby, and I knew as I got older that this was an opportunity that I was blessed with to be in places and see things in an American story as my husband ran for these offices and to be thankful that I could now write and tell people what I had to tell them. And that was why I ended up here. Now, when you were growing up, did your parents talk um, much about their experiences during the Holocaust? They talked, but not so much. I mean, they talked. My mother would say, oh, that's something I saw back then. Or, oh, this is what we, our uniform, she had it in a drawer from Auschwitz. Uh, and both of my parents talked, but they didn't over talk about these things. And my mother just said, look, I cannot even recall some of the things that happened to me. I knew she had lost her family there. I knew for both my parents, and I knew there were many stories I had not heard. And so, and we were in Gardner, Massachusetts, so there weren't friends from the Shoah. They, I know there were groups in New York that got together, New Jersey, who are, were Shoah survivors, Holocaust survivors, and they came together. I didn't, I didn't have that. I was in a totally different atmosphere where no one spoke Yiddish, which so was my what only- What was it like conflict. growing up in Gardner? as the, your father was the town, the local rabbi? He was a rabbi. My dad had gone to a yeshiva at an early age. And I think he started at the age of five. And that was amazing. And he, when we had to make our emancipation, our immigration story to the United States, he had practiced law, he'd studied it, but he wasn't about to go into law in the States, which is what he would have had to do. And instead, he applied to a congregation in Gardner, Massachusetts. So my father sat at his desk with a tape recorder. <laughs> Excuse. Take some water. <laughs> <laughs> my hay fever, so please excuse me. Anyway, so my father really had to learn how to talk to give a sermon to people who only spoke English in Gardner, Massachusetts. And they were everything from not Orthodox, conservative to reform to unaffiliated. And I know one time when my dad first started out and we weren't with him that Yom Kippur, he said he knelt down for Quorum, the kneeling service on Yom Kippur. And when he jumped out, he turned around and no one understood what he had done. So that's that's how it happened. We were in a very different place. And I guess one of the stories to show just how different it was, was that I went to kindergarten and the kindergarten teacher had this big basket she put over our heads filled with candy and dolls and cars and trucks. And if you were good that day, you got to put your hand up and take something out of the basket. 
I was surprised because I never saw anything like that. And I came home on that first day of kindergarten and my mother said in Yiddish, how did it go? How was the day? And I looked at her and I said, mommy, no more Yiddish, only English. The way of the immigrant. So your parents um, had amazing resilience, which I think you have too. Um, I love this line. Your father told you to, you know, go out and write your name in the sky. Um, I wonder, how do you explain their spirit and their resilience and all that they accomplished here? They came out of nightmares. When I was younger, I was a young child. My mother, I remember the, the screaming at night from her nightmares. And, you know, I would listen. I, would, I didn't know what to think. I'd never heard nightmare screams. I never knew anyone who had nightmares. So it was one of those amazing times where you depend on parents to give you lessons, to help you. They simultaneously talked about slave labor camp. I know my father would talk about how when he march through cold areas, I think some of them Russia, and some of the men marching froze and died on the side of the road. And my father remembers how he felt horrible that these were Jews who were not going to be buried. And he would often say to me, I always felt horrible. Who would say Kaddish? Who would say the mourner's prayer for these dead people? So it was always there. But at the same time, my parents wanted us to do well in school, to be proud Jews, to get people to respect us, and to try to make other Jews who knew nothing about it understand what meant so much to you as a Czech immigrant? Mm -hmm. So I've been getting a, a lot of questions and one related question just came in. Someone who read the book asks, um, she said that you say, I bear some of the hidden scars of a survivor's child and is wondering, you know, what are those scars and what did you mean by that? Well, I think that most survivors kids and in the meantime, there are less and less parent survivors because they're aging rapidly. But most of those descendants, like I just talked about nightmares. I know I always thought about relatives. I'd never had a table full of people for Thanksgiving until you know, I got married, there were others, or holidays. You were limited to your parents or my Rojanani and Moshibachi, my Aunt Rose and Uncle Moshibachi. I knew what to call them in Hungarian. And these were few people that you had, but I was raised to be strong, to be honest, and to stand straight as a Jew and to understand that we, and I repeat this all the time to friends, to kids, grandchildren, we are the PR for our people. What they see is what they know. So the book goes on from your family to talk about so many different aspects of your life. But one of the things that I thought would be particularly interesting for us to talk about here um, is your, your journey with breast cancer. And I think the book, if I'm right, is the first time that you've really spoken out publicly about it. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your experience, Hadassah? I have never talked about it publicly except for a few friends and even not all my friends. 
I never, it was private. And with time, and as I was writing this book, I said to myself, it's not fair because maybe someone will derive a lesson from what I have to say and share. Maybe I can be of help. What happened to me is I was working for the Susan G. Coleman group and trying to help people and went to Brazil and international activities for breast cancer and did the Israel Day Parade in Jerusalem, all these events, all these things. Then one night I was lying in bed, sitting in bed, watching TV. And all of a sudden I touched myself and I found a lump. And my husband was right there. And he said, what's the matter? I said, I just found a lump, Joey. And he said, you have to go to the doctor tomorrow. Well, I thought I was in a nightmare dream. The next day I went to be x-rayed and sure enough, they found something, but they said they had to put something in to determine if it was cancerous or not. And I thought I was in a, a dream I'd never had before. He told me, yes, it is. And you now have to go to the hospital for this. And I was lucky. And then they had to find out what stage it was at. All of those details. And I found out, luckily, I was stage one. And I needed to have whatever was there removed. And then I started, I think it was weekly chemotherapy. And did that for the time. And then I had the HER too. So I had to have the medicine for that. I was told if this, this is only seven years old or six years old, if you had had this earlier, you would not have medicine for it. And then I went through the radiation. So the experience taught me, you can't be afraid. You have to go forward. And I realized that even more when I met these poor women from Brazil and women in Saudi Arabia where they had to have cars, trucks coming to their section of the world. And I went through that and I remember with the chemotherapy, the doctor said to me, well, you may lose your hair. And I thought, oh no, I don't wanna lose my hair. And it took a few months and then I lost my hair. And my daughter, Hani said, you have to go buy a wig, mommy. And we did that. And it was all, and losing hair for some women's tra women is traumatic. Well, for me, it's, it seemed so minor league and shallow, but that was a big shock. So, go ahead, sorry. I was gonna say, what was helpful to you in getting through those difficult days? Well, what was particularly helpful, and I remember this because I had some friends who knew about this and one of them across the street from Georgetown Hospital, Georgetown University Hospital, said to me, oh, I'll bring you over to chemo. I'll bring you over. And I said, no, thank you. Um, I've made it, or I was able to do it at 7 a.m. So Joe could come and do it with me before he went to work. And I remember, you know, he'd be sitting there and sometimes the phone calls from these famous colleagues, whatever, were there. And it was, it was so funny because I was saying, oh, my God, and here I, you know, have the chemo intravenous. So that is the greatest thing that helped me. Also, my children were very supportive. 
and very caring and kept saying to me, you know, you can do this. You can do this. You're smart. Honey would always, you know, the baby, she would always say, you're brave, you're smart, you have to do this. So you'll just have a wig, big deal. So was your, your natural optimism and resilience helpful to you? Was that a source of strength? Yes, yes, it was helpful. But having never gone through this, it was helpful in a remote way because this was a new experience and I'd never had it. And I began to understand how so many women go through this and traveling around the world. So many women don't identify it and they don't make it. They can die from breast cancer. And today we have more and more better cures and I know when I discovered it, it was backward and it was what, 11 years or so, backward to what happens today. Today, they tailor things toward the individual more because we're more advanced. So we have to say thank you to places like Sharsharet, which help us all get better and thank God I have been better. Many people are writing in the chat that those very words. Thank God that you know that you're okay. Um, what about the word sur survivor? Are you comfortable with the word breast cancer survivor? We talk about Holocaust survivors. We talk about survivors of divorce. Does that sit comfortably with you? Yes, yes, absolutely. Because a breast cancer survivor that describes exactly what she, he are. They're breast cancer survivors. That's what they survived. And they're lucky to be a survivor. So, you know, I don't have any, there's no, I don't compare the two or talk about the two in the same context. Holocaust survivor is a very different label than a breast cancer survivor. They're both survivors but different areas. Um, thank you, Hadassah. So um, we move on to talking about the subject of immigration. And I, I think it would be interesting for people to hear you read a little section of the book because it's written so beautifully. Oh, so, okay. um, yes, I would love to do that. The beginning of... Um, Chapter three, my immigrant identity, which begins on page 22. Maybe just read a few of those paragraphs. It, it would yes. Be really good for you. And I think it's great for people to hear, you know, the writing on the page because it really is beautiful. And I also narrated an audio tape of the book, oh, which great. was a different experience. My immigrant identity. Let me begin with a quote, Exodus. 23, 9. I chose this. You shall not oppress a stranger, for you know the feelings of a stranger, having yourselves been strangers in the land of Egypt. If I had to summarize the essence of the American immigrant experience in a single word, I would choose promise. I've met thousands of my fellow immigrants and promise runs through us like current through copper wire. The word itself, promise, means both a vow that something will happen and the potential for achievement. These are the assurances that bolster the courage of those who leave their country and set out in search of a better life. It is also a good descriptor for the American shores on which they land. Every immigrant believes that the opportunity to advance socially, economically, and personally in this country is more than a possibility. It has the certainty of a promise. I'm not suggesting that immigrants view the United States as a utopia where all of their problems magically disappear. Immigrating to a new country has never been easy. 
it can be an arduous, sometimes terrifying, and often disorienting experience. Immigrants find themselves uprooted from all that is familiar in a place where the food seems strange, the language indecipherable, the culture endlessly confusing, the dislocation that comes from living far from extended family and facing the difficulty of finding work can be daunting. Even minor differences can make them stand out in a way that has them questioning where they belong. It is a willing sacrifice, yes, but a sacrifice nonetheless. As I write, these are especially anxious times for immigrants. Though xenophobia has always existed, it seems to have increased of late. For sure, we need rules about who can enter our country and we have to watch our borders. But I believe that if we view immigrants with respect, they will view themselves with respect. And that is crucial to moving forward together. The vast majority of new arrivals will contribute to our country. Thank you, Adesson. Thank, Thank you. Um, so would you say that you still see the world as an immigrant? Oh, I don't see everything as an immigrant, but I am born as an immigrant and I see much from that perspective. It's interesting. One day I was going into New York with Joe in a car and the man who was driving him to work because I was getting off close to his office. So I thought I'll hitch a ride. He was a Pakistani driver and he heard me talking in the back seat to Joe about immigration. I was just telling him some things I thought. And then this gentleman said, oh, Hadassah, I would like my children to read that book, to read that chapter because you were talking as an immigrant and I want my children to understand what you're saying. I was talking about the danger. See, when parents don't understand a language so well, your children come home with friends who speak another language that they don't understand. And then they're sort of erased from getting to know your friends and talking to them in a decent way. So I remember that instant. And the other thing I wanted to make note of now is I can't tell you the number of immigrants during campaigns who came up to me and the Secret Service would try to get more of a distance. And I would say, oh, let me, let me talk to her closer. And they would say, you are an immigrant. You will understand me. Thank you. I'm an immigrant. And I was so touched by that every time that happened. Do you think that your experience and your parents' experience also had some influence on Joe as a lawmaker? Oh, for sure. Joe's always been sensitive to immigrants and immigration. His grandparents immigrated, not his parents. And so he always was mindful of it. But having a wife and in-laws coming from different places and ways, he began to understand how different it is living with an immigrant and living with immigrants' daughter and son. So I think, yes, I think people who listen and keep their eyes and ears open to immigrants are really made more sensitive to the journeys they have to take to move forward. Thank you. So I, another really interesting aspect of the book that I think people will find particularly interesting is 
how you, this remarkable balance that you're able to achieve between being, you know, being a very public person and living a very observant lifestyle and not compromising. Um, what was that like for you being, you know, in public life and being on the road? Well, when I met Joe, he was Shomer Shabbat as I, and we were both kosher. And Joe made it clear that he was running for office, the national, you know, Senate before Attorney General, but certainly the national office. And he made it clear that he was going to continue observing Shabbat unless there were crises, you know, in his position. But otherwise, and it's so funny because Al Gore said to me, I'll never forget, um, we were just, we were laughing. And he said, you know, I've been missing out on Sundays for a long time now. I think what I'm going to do is I'll take over watching everything more carefully on Saturday. And Joe will watch Sunday more carefully. <laughs> so I laughed when I heard that. So it really, what we did showed people, we were in the Midwest, for example, for one of the campaign shows. And I was at the one I was at um, alone. And I was walking around, shaking hands. And these people came up to me. I had no idea, were they gonna vote Democratic, Republican, Independent, or nothing. And they said to me, I like your husband. He is a religious man. We like him. And when I had people come up to me in that way, I was really touched. I was touched as a Jew, as a person, as an American. And so many times there were fond, more intimate personal stories conveyed as we marched through the town in a very personal way meaningful way. So how has keeping Shabbat enriched your life over these years? Well, keeping Shabbat has always been an important moment for Joe and I and our children. We sit at a table together and we're not going to the TV. We're not going in a car. We're not going to the movies. It's our time as a family to sit together, to pray together, to sing together. It's a very special moment. As a matter of fact, Joe did this beautiful book on Shabbat, and it's now, this fall, going to be published in a translation to Hebrew wow. in Israel. So that will be interesting, I'm sure, for Americans, but... Israeli Americans or Israelis in general. So I'm looking forward to that sharing. So we, we were blessed with Shabbat and people who truly observe it know this. But what happened when we went around the country and one of the times we marched from the hotel to the synagogue Shabbat morning. And we walked all the houses on the sides of the street came out because they either had a wedding reception or a dinner party. And they all, and some of them even said Shabbat Shalom, hearing that. And so everyone wanted to make us welcome. And we appreciated that. And so we had all the different staff people marching with us for Shabbat to the synagogue. And when we got there, I asked the rabbi, I said, Rabbi, the synagogue is very full. And I said, does this happen every week? He said, no. There are people who have come for 95 miles. I never had such a crowd. So it was, it was part of our time. And it was, it was special. And 
people really enjoyed it and liked it and felt we were a different breed of couple, parent, you know, children. It was very special. I think you also like did a service to observant people who now, you know, feel more understood um, in the world. Oh, yes. Well, that was what happened. It was so funny because someone, some young woman said she had just started a job and she was trying to tell her boss that she was Sabbath observant. And he looked, he said, you know, like Joe Lieberman. So he said, oh, okay. <laughs> so cute. So you don't know how you influence people, right? So I think listeners might enjoy hearing the story of how you met Joe. Oh, okay. Well, it's a great story. He tells it better, but he tells it longer. And I'm going to make it. You tell it well, too. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, Joe and I, well, I have a roommate. I was at Stern College for two years, part of YU, Yeshiva University. And then I went to Boston University. So I had a roommate from Stern College who ended up going to Boston University for graduate school and coming and joining in an apartment. And she wanted me to meet someone who was in her synagogue in New Haven, Connecticut. So I didn't know, I listened and she said, I want you to meet him. He's a politician, but he's a nice guy. So I thought, well, that's an introduction. Then she said, and he looks a little bit like your son, Eitan. So this is, this is good. So I thought, okay, I'm listening, quiet. And then I went up to her house for a Shabbat. And I was there Friday night. Then Shabbat afternoon, I was sitting in her garden outside and reading. And then all of a sudden, Joe Lieberman walked out because she had told him she wanted him to meet me and so he said, well, I'll walk over. So he walked over, came in and introduced himself to me. And he was in the midst of his campaign for attorney general. So he then asked me, oh, do you have time to go out tonight? So, you know, you think someone asks you that, they'll tell you they'll pick you up at seven, eight, whatever. So it, was, it had to be later after Shabbat. So he said to me, I have a social political fundraiser at someone's home in the middle of the state. And why don't you come with me? And then we'll go out after around 11, 1130, I should be done. Well, I looked at him, I said, well, what are you gonna call me? What are you gonna, what are you gonna say I am? And he said, you'll be my driver. I thought, oh, God, this is funny. Okay. So as I'm going through these little shakos, then that night we went to this place and we were sitting down and we were talking. And I thought, this is a nice man. And then we started talking about the kids we have. And I was thinking, hmm, he has two teenagers. I have a six-year-old at that point. Anyway, we went to my friend's house and we sat in the living room till 3 a.m. Then he said, I have to go because I have to go for a political rally in Hartford or whatever it was. Campaign stops all day, but I'll call you. So he ended up coming down to see me after his campaigning a couple times a week, or I would go up and end up in a fundraiser or a political rally. And Still is the driver? <laughs> no, no, he had his, yeah, right. No, he had a guy who was an, a policeman who became a close friend. Well, he was to Joe, Jimmy O'Connell, and he was very close with our family. So he'd be, he'd be, you know, driving back and forth afterwards. This was after all the stuff he's doing. And I'll never forget, Joe's daddy said one time, he said, you better, you better be careful. You're going to, you're, you're doing so much driving around the two of you. You have to be careful. It's too much time taken down the road. So then we decide, he said, well, 
the election is in November and we can't announce our engagement. He didn't want to announce anything before. And so we ended up with his uncle and my parents and his parents going to my apartment to have, you know, a brunch. And then we decided we'll go to Moshe Peking afterwards. We had seen a play, um, Amadeus, I think it was. And then we went to Moshe Peking. I'd never seen this kosher Chinese place they brought me to. And we had a lovely time. Then we finally were able within time to announce our engagement and to get married and to learn about each other's kids, which was our you know, time. Very nice. So was being a rabbi's daughter in some ways good training to being a political wife? Oh, yeah. Because you can't, according to my parents anyway, a rabbi's daughter does not speak too loudly, negatively in public. And you behave a certain way. My mother was always, oh, tie your hair back. Oh, wear, no, you wear a skirt for this. You wear, I was in kindergarten and she had me wearing skirts and my hair tied back in braids and so I, I was used to that, you know? Well, if you have the old fashioned European family, it's totally different uh -huh. than the American. And then, and then our grandkids today, you know, everyone gets a little different. Mm -hmm. So it was, um, it was an experience to, and I have friends who have European parents and we share some of our experiences and we share how we're different. And we tend to like people who are more like us, but I like everyone. I can't say that political wife. Um, I wanna make sure we have time to talk about your own professional life and some of the interesting work you've done. Um, maybe you can tell us a bit about your career trajectory and also what you're working on these days. Okay. Well, these days, my book and the Zooms and the interviews and, it's a lot. I'm just waiting to emerge out of this. So right now, and I'm really thinking about my next chapter. I'm not sure. I have to sort of breathe some air after all the stuff I'm doing. And I started out, I was a political science major. And I remember that I did all kinds of things. And one of the things that I did in high school was I was the winner of the I Speak for Democracy contest. And of course, my father sat down to his desk and said, I must edit this a little. And I thought, oh my, you know, cause my father wasn't gonna let me go without having it edited. And then I won and I will never forget, I was in the Congressman from Massachusetts and it wasn't Ted Kennedy car, it's convertible. And I sat there and I stood up and I was waving to the people. And my parents who always went to Memorial Day, always did every, every patriotic American event. So you had to see this event and, and salute it. And when I went by them, they were waving with a smile and I saw the tears in their eyes. Because to them, I had come to the top of the small, in their minds, the top of the small town, Gardner, Massachusetts, with a congressman riding through the streets, waving with the music. And then I studied, I wanted to, so my father, first of all, at first I wanted to study China. And I thought I was going to do studies at Boston University in China. I had some great professors. And my father went with me for a visit. And he didn't like the cubbies, the little seated lounges with the boys and girls together. My father said, nicht for dear. That was it, not for you. And he said, you must, we will go to Stern College for women and you will go there for two years at least. So there I was, and I continued my political science history 
and I always did theater. And then after two years, I decided I was going to move to Boston, enter Boston University and study international relations, American government and China, which I found so interesting how leaders could control a country that large with that many people. And well, this, the secret word in it is, you know, you have to have the right type of government to do what they've done. But anyway, that was great. And then I got out and I worked for a few um, pharmaceutical firms. I was specializing in women's health and the cures. And I, I, at that point, I studied a little bit about breast cancer and problems in pregnancy, all the things that touch women so strongly. And then I was at the National Health Screening and talking about the importance and studying the importance of science and mathematics in this new age that was looking more and more computer-like. I was somewhat struck by the changes in the work environment. So there were, oh, there's so many other, and it's in the book. So they have to get the book to read the rest of it, please. Um, another thing, you write um, quite openly in the book also about divorce um, and more of about how you really successfully, um, you know, merged your, your families and created this really strong family. And I, I think you have a great attitude about that. Can you share a bit about that um, with us? Yes, I would love to because this is an important chapter in the book. And I feel compelled to talk to people about this experience because it's become part of our culture. More and more people are divorcing. And some of the divorces are coming earlier and some of them later, but it is happening around us. And I began to talk about when I married, and I talked about that aspect too. We all marry for first time. And if you divorce, you're divorcing from that first time, but you owe it to your children to make sure, hopefully not every couple can do that. Not every divorcee can do that. It's very important to tell them that they have been the firstborns who came out of an earlier marriage. And it's important for you to respect them so that every time you walk into a joyous occasion, a simcha, it is not marked in a negative, dark way because you and your ex-spouse are arguing. You can't do that. I know that's very hard. I'm not saying everyone can do that. But we decided no step. We call our children our son, sons, and our daughters. No step anything. You marry a partner and you have to take on their children and love and show love, even if it's hard. It didn't happen right away. It took me a few years. And you know what you have to do during those few years? Shut your mouth because you can't leave footprints. It's different. You yell at a kid you've given birth to, they're, they don't feel it as badly. If you're trying to build a relationship, you have to be careful not to have arguments that leave bad tracks in the sand. So I think that divorce is very, very, you know, one of the things I said and my, um, my children's mother called me on it when we talked and she just said she was touched because I talked about the chuppah with our daughter and 
we were standing under the chuppah and her mother was next to me and we leaned on each other's arms and I felt that. And she was so touched that I had even said that in a book review of my book. So. That's beautiful, really. So we're, we're running out of time. I have lots more questions, but one quick thing that's come in from somebody listening is like, can you give advice to somebody about how to be a good caregiver? And what are the things that somebody should be thinking about? A caregiver of, for someone else's children. For someone else, I, I think specifically relating to, you know, someone who's suffering from breast cancer and oh. someone who's taking care. Oh, a caregiver of a breast cancer, yes, who has children or who may not have children. You know what? A caregiver has to be honest, trustworthy. And really, I think for a woman going through breast cancer, some women want to talk to someone intimately and they want someone to listen to them. I was not that way, but I did have my husband to talk to. But being a care, you have to differentiate between a person who wants to talk to you and needs to talk to you, and you need to be helpful and sweet and ask them, what's the kind of, do you want some ice cream? Do you, what would you like? What kind of drink do you want? Or what can I get you that would be fun? Or where can we go together just to be together and not see anyone and do what you want to do? You have to try to be closer because they're, they're missing things. Some of them are missing an appendage of their body. It's just, it's a hard experience. And they may have lost hair, so you have to help them. I had this great hat. Everyone complimented me on it. It was a baseball hat with hair coming out of the bottom of the baseball hat. And I looked so good. It was so cute. I was like a baseball player and I didn't have hair underneath. And everyone was, oh, this is great. And no one had, to, I went everywhere and nobody knew. So it's, it's really helping a person. But just like they are now looking at the individual who has breast cancer with the individual therapy, the caregiver has to look at that individual as a person who may need to talk, someone else who doesn't want to, and you have to figure it out as a caretaker who cares. Thank you, Hadassah. So I really wanna recommend that everybody read Hadassah's terrific book. Um, thank you so much, Hadassah, for your wisdom, your candor, your generosity. It's really great to hear you and um, want to thank you. And I'm going to turn it back to Ilana. Okay, let me thank you, Sandy. Nice to be it's with you. You're terrific. I really appreciate it. Okay, okay, I'll turn it back now. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Hadassah, I think you've done Thanks. it. Thank you. Uh, kindergarten from the holocaust to kindergarten to immigration to politics to shabbat to marriage and love to divorce and love um you've done it all uh you are a true american here heroine and so much for us to learn from you and thank you for sharing so personally about your breast cancer i remember at the time it was so private um right. and you know we're happy that we were able to uh be stay involved, close with you all these years. So really, you're terrific, Sandy. You did a great job bringing out really salient points. I also encourage everyone to purchase the book through Amazon, and the link is in our website. Um, we also want to thank, again, our sponsors, Merck and CGen. Um, and also, there's a quick evaluation survey in the chat. I really encourage you. It'll take two seconds. Click on it. Let us know your thoughts. It really helps us to develop our programs. It really, it, evaluations are your ways of telling us instead of us talking to you. So please fill them out. Um, again, take, um, if you also, if you do fill out the survey, um, you have a chance to win one of three personalized autograph copies 
of tonight's book, Hadassah, an American story. And um, if you were as inspired as I was, you want that book in your house with her name on it, with her, <laughs> with her personal stamp, because uh, she's someone that, that makes a difference. So uh, please fill out the survey. We'll get your books right away. Hadassah will sign them. And um, it's, it's, it was really so terrific tonight. Um, following up on this, we have another webinar next uh, Monday night, June 7th, for National Cancer Survivors Day. I know Hadassah spoke a lot about Holocaust survivor, cancer survivor. Um, there's a lot more to that discussion, and this is just the springboard for that. Um, uh, finally, just to remind you what Sharshara does, a lot of you came on for Sharshara, but I know more of you came on to hear Hadassah's story. So please remember, we all know someone who's touched by breast cancer and ovarian cancer, whether they're living with it or at risk. Sharshara provides free and confidential, compassionate, emotional support, mental health counseling, financial subsidies for non-medical services, um, and life-saving education. So please feel free. We are eager to hear from you to help you we want to that's what we do so you know besides the book clubs we're doing that too so um your health and well-being that's the priority um so feel free to lean on us thank you again Hadassah you were wonderful Sandy terrific um if you haven't filled out the evaluation once more and really um and thank you all for joining us this evening uh stay well stay safe and we hope to see you in person sometime soon have a good night. Thank you. Share, share. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.